Hey guys, Beowulf is an Anglo-Saxon poem about a Scandinavian hero who defeats three different monsters, a demon named Grendel, Grendel's mother, and a dragon. This study guide is going to cover the setting, where this poem takes place. We'll talk about the historical context, the circumstances under which this poem was written. We'll talk about the only surviving ancient manuscript that we have as a record of Beowulf. And J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, had a really huge influence on how Beowulf was studied and perceived kind of in the modern era, so we'll talk about the influence he had on Beowulf. We're going to talk about the format of the poem, how it's set up, and then I'll do a full summary of what happens. I'm not sure how long this is going to be, but there will be timed links in the description box down below. If you want to skip around to certain sections, feel free to do that. The characters and the places in this poem are not modern English words, so they're kind of hard to pronounce. So I'm going to link a pronunciation guide down below as well if you want to check that out. So where does Beowulf take place? Well, Beowulf is, well, most scholars think he's a fictional hero, not real, but if he was a real person, obviously the things that he does in the poem have been greatly fictionalized. But he belonged to a very real people group known as the Geats, and they lived in what is today southern Sweden. Beowulf sails from basically the southern coast of Sweden down to Denmark, where he helps a Danish king whose people are being terrorized by this demonic monster named Grendel. And the place in Denmark where Beowulf travels to is known as Heorot. And if you were to go to Heorot today, it would be pretty close to where Copenhagen is. I remember the first time that I was reading Beowulf as a teenager, and I was pretty much told by my teacher, go home, read Beowulf, come back, and we'll take a quiz on what happened so that I can make sure you read it. And there wasn't a lot of context, there was no context really given about the circumstances under which this poem was written. And the version I was reading had the original Old English version that a modern English reader can't read, right? So I was totally reliant on the translation into modern day English. And I remember thinking, I don't know why this is in my British literature class. I don't know how this got in the British literature canon. This poem doesn't take place in Britain, none of the characters are British, it's not written in a language I even recognize as English. <laughs> so I think it's really helpful to just have some basic historical context about when this poem was written. So Beowulf is a story that was told by the northern Germanic tribes that lived near the Danes and the Geats. These tribes were the Jutes, the Angles, and the Saxons. And around the year 400 AD, the Roman Empire, which was occupying the British Isles, fell. It was no longer able to defend that territory. So the Jutes, Angles, and Saxons took notice of this, and they spend about the next 500 years moving over. And a big part of why Beowulf is such an important poem is because there's very little that is recorded from the time period of when the Angles and Saxons were migrating over to the British Isles, and there's even less available of the stories that were told before the migration that were told in the Scandinavian region. The historical context that Beowulf came out of is also really interesting because it's during this time period when the Christianization of the British Isles was underway. So there's this mix of uh, sort of pagan information and pagan stories that came from Scandinavian northern Germanic tribes. And then also there's some biblical references infused into the poem, so it's this interesting blend. For example, Grendel the monster is supposed to be a descendant of Cain, the first murderer in Genesis. So it's this interesting blend that we don't, we don't really have a lot of stories like that where there's this blended Christianization and pagan uh, philosophy kind of rolled into one. I wanted to briefly mention the manuscript that contains Beowulf. It's known as the Nowell Codex, and it contains several Anglo-Saxon poems from that migration period, including Beowulf. And the reason I find it so fascinating is because I was just kind of under the assumption that Beowulf would have been continually told, maybe written down a few times, um, maybe would have at least been recorded a few times from the original manuscript, maybe using some nice calligraphy or some nice drawings or something to go along with it. But no, actually, there's just the one manuscript and I can't believe that it survived, to be honest. So there's a great source from the University of Chicago that kind of details the history of the Noel Codex, so I'll link that down below if you want to learn more. But basically, it was shuttled around to different libraries, different private libraries of people who just took an interest in 
antiquity in older texts and it was not well preserved and one of the libraries actually caught on fire and the edges of the pages of the Noel Codex were singed and portions of Beowulf were lost for forever. <laughs> and eventually the British Museum gets a hold of the Noel Codex and has it in, in their possession in the mid 1700s. But the British Museum doesn't take any steps to preserve the manuscript nor do they even bother to record its contents. So it continues to just deteriorate. The pages just kind of are falling apart and even more of the text is lost. And finally, eventually, um, in the mid 1700s, a man from Denmark who had a lot of interest in historical texts that came out of that Anglo-Saxon migration period, uh, he comes and is researching through the British Museum and finds Beowulf and he's really taken with it and decides to record it a few times. Thank goodness. Um, so today there's, you know, digital scans of the manuscript and we have many recordings, but that was not the case um, for a large period of history. Having spent the first part of this study guide talking about Beowulf as a historical document, I want to really switch gears and I want to talk about a very famous essay called Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics. This was written by J.R.R. Tolkien, the very famous author of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. He first gave it as a lecture, and it had a huge impact on how Beowulf is studied and perceived today. So it wasn't an immediate impact, but it's had quite a lasting impact. I want to be just honest and kind of get this out there. So when I was first reading Beowulf as a teenager for school, I absolutely hated this poem. I think I put it in my top 10 books that school made me hate. I hated it. The reason is that there's a lot of tangents in Beowulf. The narrator kind of goes off. It departs from the story of Beowulf doing things and starts telling you about some other person who lived some other place at some other time. And you're like, why, why is this happening? <laughs> it seems random. Um, also, there's a huge cast of characters in Beowulf, and they have relatively little to do. Um, however, scholars think that the audience at the time that Beowulf was being told would have been familiar with these characters and would have known other stories that went along with them. So they would have been like, oh yeah, that guy, I know him from this story. Um, but as a teenager, you know, I didn't know that. I don't have that context. Modern readers don't have that context. So Beowulf was very famous as a historical document. Because there was so little remaining from the culture in which Beowulf took place, there was very little insight. So scholars were very taken with Beowulf and wanting to dissect that as much as possible, wanting to see some insight into Norse politics, insight into Norse mythology. And this really bothered Tolkien. It's not so much that he had an issue with studying a piece of literature from a historical perspective, but he said, you know, enough. First and foremost, Beowulf is a poem. It is a story, and it should be appreciated for that. I watched a lecture from Dr. Thomas Shippey about Tolkien and his connection with Beowulf, which I found really interesting, and I will link it down below. There's actually two lectures that he did. And in one of his lectures, he splits out Beowulf into seven sections, and these seven sections are grouped into two types of the poem. So there's A sections and B sections, and the, what he calls the A sections are basically where all of the historical information takes takes place. All of the politics, um, all of the cultural information, the side stories, all the exposition, that's where that's taking place in these four different A sections. And then there's B sections. Those are the action sections where Beowulf is fighting a monster. He's fighting Grendel, he's fighting Grendel's mother, and then he's fighting a dragon. And Tolkien's point in The Monsters and the Critics is basically there has been such a disproportionate focus on the A sections, the historical analysis, the political situations, the exposition, but the heart of Beowulf is these B sections. It's the action. It's Beowulf fighting the monsters. That is the heart and meat of Beowulf, and that's what Beowulf should be appreciated for. And modern retellings of Beowulf have definitely followed Tolkien's advice. If you've ever seen Skyrim, it's basically a modern retelling of Beowulf. Beowulf has 3,182 lines, and it does not have any set form of rhyme or meter. The literary device that really holds the poem together is alliteration, where the beginning consonant sounds of words are close together and they're the same, they match. The point of view for the poem is told from a pretty distant third person, kind of one of those 
all-knowing narrators that can kind of skip around in time, can follow different people around. Um, if you've read the Song of Ice and Fire series, that's a very close third person. Beowulf is a very distant third person. One last thing that I wanted to mention about the format of Beowulf is that scholars have kind of debated even if Beowulf deserves to be considered as an epic poem. So personally, I think it does because to me, an epic means following around a great hero um, who is doing all of these heroic deeds and I think Beowulf matches that perfectly. But if you look at other ancient epic poems, um, Greek epics and Roman epics, they often start invoking a muse or a goddess, and they usually start with stating the theme of the poem. And Beowulf just doesn't do that. It just kind of starts. It actually starts by talking about the lineage of Danish kings. So as I mentioned, Beowulf starts off talking about the Danish royal lineage. It starts off talking about Shield Chiefson, the king who founded the royal Danish line, and it goes through that lineage all the way up through King Hrothgar. And this is really where the story pertaining to Beowulf comes in. So the Danes are enjoying prosperity. Life is good under King Hrothgar. King Hrothgar ends up building this giant mead hall. It's a place where the Danes can come and drink and eat and tell stories and just be merry. And so all of this kind of ruckus captures the attention of Grendel, a demon who lives in a nearby swamp. Grendel is supposed to be descended from Cain, the uh, figure in the Bible who kills his brother, the first murderer in the book of Genesis. One of the songs being sung in the Mead Hall is about God's creation, and this makes Grendel really angry. So later, when all of the men in the Mead Hall are asleep, Grendel comes in and kills a bunch of them in a fit of rage. Grendel continues to go on these murderous rampages for 12 years, <laughs> a really long time. He's terrorizing Hararat. And word of this spreads to the nearby tribes. They're like, wow, have you heard about this terrible demon who's terrorizing the Danes? And so word actually goes up to Gateland, where Beowulf lives. And King Hrothgar had once done a really huge favor for Beowulf's family. And Beowulf remembers this, and he decides to gather 14 of his strongest warriors and sail down to Heorot, and he offers to defeat Grendel and save the Danish people. Hrothgar obviously accepts Beowulf's offer, and then he gathers everyone into the Mead Hall to celebrate that Beowulf has come to kill Grendel. And there's this one naysayer among the Danes, his name is Unferth, and he's like, actually, Beowulf, I don't think you're going to be able to kill Grendel because you lost this swimming match against a guy named Brekka. And this is where the poem goes into this digression about what happened during the swimming match. But basically, Beowulf is like, no way, Unferth, let me tell you what happened during that swimming match. I got sidetracked defeating nine sea monsters, and while I was killing all these sea monsters, I wound up washing up on the coast of Finland. And so everyone's all excited. They're like, yay, Beowulf killed all these sea monsters. He's totally going to be able to kill Grendel. Night falls. All of the Danes leave the Mead Hall. Beowulf and his tribe of Gant warriors stay. And sure enough, uh, Grendel comes up. Well, before Grendel comes up, Beowulf decides to take off all of his armor. He basically fights Grendel in the nude because uh, he thinks he's just that invincible. And he's right. He is that invincible. So Beowulf gets locked into a fight with Grendel and ends up ripping Grendel's arm off. And bleeding profusely, Grendel retreats to his swamp where he dies. So the next morning, all of the Danes come back and they're overjoyed to see Grendel's ripped off arm. The Danes start singing praises about how wonderful Beowulf is, how strong he is. They also start singing about a bunch of other things. And honestly, this is where my attention kind of trailed off. But they sing about a guy named Sigmund who killed a dragon, which foreshadows things to come in Beowulf. And they sing about an evil king who was a king of the Danish people called King Harabon. King Hrothgar's queen also comes into the Mead Hall and she ends up awarding gifts to Beowulf. She gives him armor and she also gives him a gold necklace. This is where the first section of the poem really ends. The second section of the poem begins the following night when Grendel's mother comes into the Mead Hall super enraged that her son had been killed. Grendel's mother is a pretty terrible monster in her own right, and she ends up grabbing King Hrothgar's most trusted advisor as her captive, and she also takes back Grendel's arm. 
Beowulf and his men weren't staying in the mead hall that night with the Danes. So Beowulf shows up the next morning and like, hey guys, what's going on? And so King Hrothgar entreats him to go find and slay Grendel's mother. Grendel's mother lives in a lake where the water burns like fire. And Hrothgar tells Beowulf that this lake is so deep that no one has ever reached the bottom of it. So all of the warriors go off with Beowulf to the lake where Grendel's mother lives. And along the way, unfortunately, they find the head of Hrothgar's most trusted advisor who had been taken as a captive. He, uh, yeah, he didn't make it. So Unferth, if you remember the guy who was taunting Beowulf earlier, he ends up giving Beowulf a gift before he jumps into the lake. Unferth gives Beowulf a famous sword that has never been defeated in battle. The sword's name is Hrunting because every good sword needs a name, right? So Beowulf jumps into the lake. There's all manner of sea monsters living in this lake other than Grendel's mother. There's a bunch of other sea monsters. And so he's fighting those. It takes him the better part of a day to reach the bottom of the lake. Beowulf apparently doesn't need to breathe, so that's cool. Hrunting ends up being totally useless against Grendel's mother, the sword that Unferth gave him. Um, he's fighting Grendel's mother with his fists, but she's matching him blow for blow. And lucky for Beowulf, it turns out that Grendel's mother kept a sword forged by giants, this really powerful sword capable of killing her. She kept it like right beside her for some reason. So Beowulf grabs that and uses that to slay Grendel's mother. So the Danes are just overjoyed at this and King Hrothgar sends Beowulf back to the southern coast of Sweden where they're from, uh, but he sends them with a bunch of treasure. So Beowulf and his warriors return to their home tribe, the Geats, who live in what is currently the southern coast of Sweden. And then there's this kind of tangent um, about a queen, Queen Modthrith, who was very evil and would torture her subjects. So she serves as a foil to the current queen of the Geats, who was very hospitable. And so Beowulf returns and he gives a large portion of the treasure that the Danish king um, gave him. He gives that to the king of the Geats, King Hialak. So this is the point in the poem where time starts to move very quickly. The King Hialak, the King of the Geats, he ends up being killed in battle and Beowulf ends up ascending to the throne. So Beowulf rules as a great king for about 50 years and this is where I would say the third and final portion of Beowulf begins. As it turns out, there's this huge cache of treasure underneath Beowulf's kingdom that has been guarded by a dragon for a very long time. And there's this slave who's running away from a really cruel master and he comes across this treasure cache and he steals a goblet. So the dragon wakes up, realizes that its goblet is missing, tries to find the thief that stole the goblet, can't find it, gets really upset and goes on this big murderous rampage across the land. And Beowulf's on throne hall ends up getting burnt down by this dragon. So now pretty much an old man, Beowulf thinks back to his youth and how he killed Grendel and had just this small group of warriors alongside of him. And he decides he's too proud to assemble an army and instead just kind of makes an A-team of men to go with him and kind of find this dragon to kill. After the dragon's murderous rampage, there's a backstory of how Beowulf ascended to the throne. It talks about how King Hialak fell in battle, and Beowulf was just ruling as an acting king until Hialak's son became old enough to rule himself, but then Hialak's son was also killed in battle later on, and so Beowulf just remained king. So Beowulf and his group of warriors are out looking for the dragon's lair and they come across the slave that stole the goblet originally and the slave leads them back to where the dragon lives. And once they get there, all but one guy, a guy named Wilaf, who was part of Beowulf's band, the rest of them turn tail and run, they're scared. And so the dragon and Beowulf both end up mortally wounding each other. They both die and Beowulf's last wish, he tells Wilof, the guy that stayed with him, bring up some of the treasure because I want to see this treasure that I have just liberated. So as he's dying, he gazes upon the treasure that he, that he saved. And Wilof buries Beowulf with the treasure and he is furious with the other warriors um, because he says, hey, this is going to show that no, now that Beowulf is no longer around to protect us, it's going to show that we are cowards. And so people are going to start invading us. And that is actually pretty much what happened to the Geats. Um, if you'll notice, so the Swedes were the tribe north of them and 
today it's known as Sweden, right? So the Swedes pretty much won that territory. So those are the things that I wish I had known about Beowulf when I had read it for the first time in school rather than being told to just go read it and then come back and take a quiz on what happened. So I hope that this was helpful to you. Please let me know down below um, if you are studying Beowulf and what you think of the poem. As always, thanks so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.